psalm that uh, Brother Wilbur read for us this morning. That's what I'll be preaching on. Psalm 116. Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon uh, the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord. And righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye, the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. You are indeed good. We thank you that you have called us to this place. You have called us to salvation. I pray that you would bless me as I seek to encourage my brethren here and to challenge us to live for you we thank you for the free offer of salvation that you won for us through your son jesus christ we thank you for the blessings that come from him and the gift of eternal life that simply is received by faith so we ask for your blessing upon us now in jesus name amen At the circular key end, and I'm talking about Sydney here. Who's familiar with Sydney? Who knows Sydney well? Okay, well, I'm going to ask you some questions later on. No, I'm not, don't worry. <laughs> At the circular key end of uh, Castle Ray Street on the corner of Bly and Hunter Streets, surrounded by buildings and office blocks, is a little square. In that little square stands a monument passed by hundreds of people every day who probably don't pay any attention to it. Does anyone know what that monument is? No. Well, I'm going to tell you. I want you to imagine, though, that in that same spot in the year 1788, more than 250 years before, instead of looking up and seeing buildings around you and office blocks and the, the noise and the bustle of people and cars and buses, there's a huge tree. And you're in the middle of a wilderness. And the sounds you hear are not the sounds of cars and people talking. It's the sound of kookaburras and people walking and soldiers marching. On a summer day, on a ridge above Sydney Cove, on the coast of New South Wales, the fellow called... Captain Arthur Phillip was the governor and around 1,500 people gathered under that tree. Around that tree and those 1,500 or so people was a mix of people. There were hardened sailors. There were soldiers. There were political prisoners, mainly Irish Catholics. There were convicts and criminals of every sort, various officials, and a young clergyman, a young pastor, who was holding a King James Bible, the same Bible that we read in this church. What was the occasion? Well, the first fleet had arrived in Australia 
and it was the first sermon preached the first church service in this country was held under that tree after a journey of eight months i'm not sure if you can imagine it uh, my, my uh, family came over from italy and i they recalled especially my mother-in-law has some uh, vivid stories about how sick she was on the trip from Italy to Australia, which lasted about 30 days, which, which is about a month, right? But can you imagine being on a ship in 1788 um, for eight months? And if you're a prisoner, you definitely weren't going first class. Um, I'm not sure if you can complain about the food either. I'm not sure how sick you would have gotten and, and, and what your living conditions would have been like. But after eight months of travelling from England to a country that you have never seen in your life and there was almost no one else here. Well, the Aborigines were here, but no one else knew you and there was nothing like you had at home. But at that place, after that eight-month long trip, the first sermon was preached in this land. And the man who preached that sermon was named Richard Johnson and he came on that first fleet and he preached on two verses which are found in this psalm verses 12 and 13 and those two verses read what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord and that's the that's the passage I'm going to be preaching from today and i want to share with you the words that were recorded that he preached as he addressed that's a decent sized number isn't it 1500 people um he started with these words because they were recorded i do not address you as churchmen or dissenters roman catholics or protestants as jews or gentiles but i speak to you as mortals and yet immortals the gospel proposes a free and gracious pardon to the guilty, cleansing to the polluted, healing to the sick, happiness to the miserable, and even life for the dead. And so, they were his opening words. And I suppose it's a wonderful way to start a sermon, isn't it? Because we are mortals yet immortal. We die, but yet we live. And that is the challenge that we face. And that is the challenge of all of mankind, that God sent Jesus into the world to fix, because we ruined it. You may wonder why I'm raising this history with you on a day when a number of people are going to be baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. Well, there are many parallels that, that I see in this history as with this particular day. The first is that the colony in Sydney represented a brand new beginning. And the baptisms we will witness today represent a brand new beginning. They picture a brand new life that was started when a person put their faith in Jesus Christ. The day they chose to receive Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, the Bible says that they were born again. A brand new life. Something totally different that they probably weren't used, to, didn't recognize at all. And in, in fact, probably the people around them didn't recognize them as well as a result of that change. You see, the people who came on those ships, and there were a number of them, because that's why it was called the First Fleet, had left their old life behind. They were going to begin a brand new life. And that voyage endured for eight months was literally a life and death event because many didn't make it here after eight months. If you got sick, well, there weren't antibiotics in those days. But the waters of baptism also symbolise a life and death event. You see, when these people go under the water, that water does not represent uh, the cleansing of a person of their sin. What it represents is death, burial, and then resurrection. When people go under, they're going to be going under backwards, like this. The same way people are laid in a coffin. And it pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when they come up, what they're declaring to all of us is they died with Jesus and they've risen again to new life. And Jesus has given them a new start. 
the decision to make a permanent shift to a new land and leave the old one wasn't even made by the convicts, I suppose. They didn't really get the choice, did they? And I suppose some of the soldiers probably didn't get the choice either. They didn't choose to leave the shores of England and their homes and friends and possibly families and go through a treacherous eight-month journey over a sea not knowing what the destination was going to be like. But some did. You see, this fellow called Richard Johnson made the decision to jump on that ship and to spend the eight months and to go there. And he did that because he loved God. And he loved the people that were on that ship. All those convicts and all those criminals and all the people that were there, he chose and made a willing decision to love them and give his life to serve them as their chaplain. This is the new life that every Christian has been called to, to love others as he, as the Lord has loved us. The decision made by these who are being baptised today to follow Christ and put their faith in him also wasn't made yesterday. Most of these people have been walking with the Lord and following him for a while now. Their voyage started a while ago with a desire to love and obey him and serve him wherever he may lead. That's why they're being baptised today because this is where he's led them. He's called them to obedience here. And in most cases, like Richard Johnson, who was on that ship with people who didn't know God, who weren't aware of what Christ had done for them, the goal for these people now is to shine the light of Jesus in sometimes a very dark place because those ships are very dark and not pleasant places to be. And we live in a world that is not very pleasant at all. God has called us to live for him in the midst of all the suffering and death that we see around us. It's a call for us to shine the light of God's truth to the people in this world and point them to Christ and tell people that there is life in him and that there is forgiveness. The second thing I want you to, to understand, the reason why I chose this particular um, uh, topic to speak about is that that little monument that stands unnoticed oftentimes in that in that city um, in circular key is a testimony of what happened on that day isn't it it's a continual um, uh, evidence that on that day this sermon took place this person preached the gospel and this is what happened there and when these people go under the water they are testifying to all of us, to all who will watch and all who are going to listen, that this is what happened to them. It's a testimony. It's a public testimony and witness that they have chosen to believe and trust Jesus with their eternal souls. It's a testimony that the gospel that they have heard, which has changed their life today, is the same gospel that was preached 235 years ago under that tree. And I don't know how many people were saved on that particular day, but I do know that the same gospel saves people the same way it has for 2,000 years. And today is no exception. And the third, for those of you who don't know what salvation means. For those of you who don't know Jesus on a personal level, if you've never come to the point in your life where you've realized that you are destined for hell and that he is the only escape and you've trusted him to save you, today I want to remind you about the frailty and the brevity of life. And that the most important decision you can ever make in your life there is no decision that will ever come anywhere close to this is to respond to the alarm bells of the gospel. That you have a short time on this world and that you have to make a decision. And making a no decision is a no decision. 
because the choice has to be made to receive Jesus Christ, to put your faith in him and to respond to the invitation that God has provided to go through that door that God has prepared. And that door, and there is only one that leads back to God. There is only one door. And that door is Jesus Christ. And don't be under any illusion this morning with all the plethora of philosophies and religions and everything else in this world that calls to you and says, oh, follow this way, you'll do okay, or follow that way, and you'll do okay. There is no other way. You see, a lot of people look to Jesus and say, what a wonderful religious teacher he was. What a prophet. What a loving person. What a person who showed us such great example you know, of self-sacrifice. Yet Jesus says, he is the way. Not a way. He says he is the truth. And he says he is the life. John 14, 6, I will quote him word for word. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, which is God the Father, but by me. You see, Jesus didn't accept any other religion in the world. He is, he says, the only way back to God. Jesus did not say, I am a way. You know, if you choose to go with me, you're going to do okay. You know, I might be a bit better than someone else. He doesn't say that. He actually says he is the way. He did not say that he discovered the truth as other religious leaders have done in the past or someone told them that truth. No, Jesus says he is the truth. He is the truth. He didn't say that he could show us the way to life. No, Jesus says he is the life. Why? How can he make such claims without blaspheming? Because isn't God all these things? Isn't God the source of life, the source of truth? And the only way? Well, he was God in the flesh. That's why he could do it. Jesus is the perfect manifestation of of God in this world. There is no one in the history of all mankind who can ever come close to him and what he taught and what he said because he is the eternal son of God. He existed before the world was ever made because he made the world. He literally, not metaphorically, not in a, in a, in a, a sort of a, a, a magical sort of sense. No, he literally came down from heaven into a sin-darkened world and was born as a baby to rescue us from our hopeless condition. I want to go back to a bit of background history about this fellow called Richard Johnson for a moment. You see, when the news was starting to spread in England about the first fleet being formed and that they were looking at actually transporting a number of people uh, to this land. The majority of them criminals, by the way. Got such a great foundation here, don't we? Um, a fellow called John Newton heard about it. Now, John Newton was a gospel minister, and yes, that's the same John Newton that wrote that famous hymn, Amazing Grace. He became interested in, uh, in this particular thing that was planned. He heard about it, that was being planned by the government. And he wondered to himself, because as part of a missionary or an evangelical society, and he wondered, wow, that's such an historic event. Who would be the right person to send to go and be the chaplain for all those people and to, to, and to begin that new life in this, this country that he knew nothing about himself? John Newton was a good friend of a fellow called William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was also an evangelical Christian who worked hard to abolish slavery okay, in England and Britain. Wilberforce was a very close friend of the newly elected 25-year-old British Prime Minister, William Pitt. And so they made a suggestion to Mr Pitt. And they brought forward this man's name, okay, and Richard Johnson. He was a 31-year-old Yorkshireman. He had studied at Cambridge University, 1780 to 1783. 
and came under the teaching of some pretty, some pretty sound evangelical preachers. Richard Johnson married uh, Mary Burton a month after he got um, appointed in this position. And five months later, they were both on a ship bound for Australia. How would you like that for a honeymoon, ladies? <laughs> Honey, we're going on a cruise for our honeymoon. Oh, where are we going? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long way away. A place called Australia. Oh, what's there? A few kangaroos and wombats and wallabies. and uh, How long is that trip going to take? Eight months. <laughs> Richard Johnson was an evangelical minister. He was a man that was convinced that the Bible is the true word of God and that repentance and trust in Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. His concern, his main concern, and I thank God for this, he was to accurately teach God's word. And so with great love and affection and with the willing participation of his wife, who just married him, they decided to actually serve God and to take the trip and to spend the rest of their lives here in this country seeking to spread the gospel. He preached with great urgency. And he called on men and women, marines and convicts alike, to turn to Christ. And Governor Philip, who was more concerned about public law and order okay, and the morals in a society, told him, stop preaching the gospel. You need to focus on preaching about stuff like not to drink and good morals and all this sort of stuff. And Johnson said, well, no, I've been called to preach the gospel. Because it's the gospel that changes people. Philip wasn't concerned about the gospel. He was concerned about the church being a good influence and raising good public citizens that would obey their government. But Johnson believed that the gospel changed the person and he understood that Christianity is not primarily called to to preach good things to people, to do good things. That's not the church's job. The church's job is to preach the gospel and then God saves that person and God grants that person a new nature. And then the rest follows. You see, in our day, a lot of people have this, this misguided belief that the church is here to teach about morality. Okay, and, and, and we should be teaching about all this stuff and, and so we influence the world in a good way. They want us to be in the community helping people, cleaning them up and turning them into good citizens. They want the church to promote good morality and good for the good of society. Don't get me wrong, the church does those things. But that's not our main calling. Johnson actually started a school himself. Within 12 years that he was here, he started a school, set up an orphan fund, cared for the needy and the sick, and he even built a church himself, which seated 500 people. He had a heart for the Aboriginal people who were being displaced with each passing year, as more and more settlers came and the more they were being driven away from the lands that, that they, they had grown up in and they had knew, he had a heart for them too. And when he had his daughter, when his daughter was born, he even gave her an Aboriginal name, Milba. And this brings us to the psalm that King David wrote 3,000 years ago. A man who trusted in God, but went through some pretty dark times in his life, times when he was pursued by King Saul, when he was surrounded by enemies, when he was betrayed by his own family. And God got him through that. And so he says in verse 1, read with me, verses 1 to 11 again. So just we remind ourselves the foundation of this passage. My focus will be on verses 12 onwards, but I want to just read the first 11 verses again because David had a lot to be thankful for. He says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, which means surrounded me, and the pains of hell got hold of me or upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. 
Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest. He's speaking to himself, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed. Therefore have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. And I said in my haste, all men are liars. David is thankful toward God because he trusted in him and the Lord answered his prayers. He was almost a dead man and God saw him through those events in his life. This is the same man who wrote these famous um, words that has comforted millions over the ages. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is that same man. God is gracious, he says. God is good. God is merciful. He is righteous. He delivers people from death. He listens to those who trust him and cares for them. And so David says... Now my soul can find rest because he's given me rest. He's given me so much. It is such a blessing to find rest with God. And that rest can only be found if you find salvation in him. Without salvation, if you didn't have Christ in your life, then you can have no rest. It's such a blessing to be at rest with God, to be at peace with God. That's why Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why can he say that? Because he's God. And only rest can be found with God, not when you're opposed to God. And so... With all these benefits, with all this thankfulness that David has, he asks a very important question in verse 12. And he says, what shall I render? What shall I give unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What can I give back to him? He says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. What can I give to God because he is so good to me? Well, the answer is, take hold of the cup of salvation. The one that he's offered you. Don't reject it. Don't avoid it. And how do you do that? By calling on his name. Let me elaborate. There is only one faith in this world that has a saviour. Only one. Every other faith in this world, every other religion in this world tells you to make your own way to heaven. Oh, sure, they'll give you the list of things to do and not to do. But it's up to you to actually find your way there. It's up to you to put in the effort. And all of them teach the same thing. Every one of them. They all say, oh, if you try hard enough and if you do good enough, God's going to somehow weigh out the balances at the end. And if you're a little bit more to the good side then God's going to lead you straight in. That is the biggest lie in all of history. All of that, that lie, which has spread throughout all the religions in the world, they're all the same, is the exact contradiction and opposite to what the gospel preaches, what the Bible preaches. And the, the gospel preaches that doesn't matter how hard you are trying, doesn't matter how much you think you've done to God, for God, there is no way you're going to make it there because you are guilty of sin. You, you can't work your way there. Who do you think you are working your way into a perfect heaven? You see, the first time, if, if that was true, that I could work my way to heaven, and if I was a 51 percenter, right? I mean, would you, honestly, would you trust a doctor to, to um, operate on you who passed with 51 percent? It's 49 percent he doesn't know. Would you trust that person? And, and, and what do you think would happen if by our own effort and, and in our own righteousness, we managed to get into heaven with a 51%? How 
how long do you think heaven would actually stay heaven before we ruined it up there as well? No, it doesn't work that way. God has to completely cleanse us of every sin and stain. And the Bible tells us very clearly that the law wasn't given to us so that we could follow it and earn our way to heaven. The Bible says the law was given to us to show us how how utterly evil we actually are. And so that we would turn to God and say, please save me. I know I'm a sinner. It's like being in the middle of an ocean and then telling someone, swim your way home. You know you're not going to make it. The Bible says that's where everyone is. Everyone is destined to drown. Unless you take the arm of the lifeguard who's been sent to save you. There is only one saviour. And we can't work our way to heaven. And the problem with mankind is that we are generally ignorant of our fall and rebellion against God. You see, um, we made this mess. See the mess that you see around us? This is not God who made this mess. This is us. Who made this mess all the stuff you see around that you know because we all have a conscience that is evil and that is bad and that is corrupt comes from us doesn't come from God God didn't force us to be evil no no we just do it naturally because that is who we actually are the Bible says that this world is fallen we started in perfect condition God gave us a perfect environment. He gave us, we were in a perfect relationship with God. We only had one thing to do. Don't eat from one tree. And you had a thousand other ones there. And what did we go and do? I want that one. And we ruined the whole relationship. We destroyed the world with our sin. We broke his law. We chose our own path. And ever since then, we have been rebellious and hateful toward God. We do not want to be told what to do. If I tell you now that God expects you to bow your knee to him, tell me there's not an ounce of rebellion that wants to come up in you and say, I'm not going to bow my knee to anyone. That's who we are. It is our very nature. And we've ruined things all along the way. So when we complain about life and the evil we see around us, we forget that we rejected God. We refuse to bow the knee to the one who created us and knows what's best for us. We were the ones who were treacherous. We are the ones who are blind. We are the ones who have committed all the worst atrocities in the, in the, the history of this world. And we even have the gall to blame him that it's his fault. That he should have stopped us. Or that somehow, even better argument, all the evil around us means he doesn't even exist. But the Bible says that God still loves us, despite our evil, despite our fallen nature. Because he is very patient. He wants no one to go to hell. He wants to be together with everyone. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 with me for a moment. 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, look at verse 9. It says there, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise to save this world, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. That means very patient to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All. God's desire is not for one person to be lost. He wants all men to be saved, all of mankind to be saved. He doesn't want one person to perish. God wants all people to come to the same place that these ones who have chosen to testify in in, in front of us that they've repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ. What does repentance mean, you might ask? We don't hear that word too often today in this culture, repentance. That's a... It's not a very uh, common word to be used. But repentance means that you've come to a point where you've changed your mind. 
you've come to a point where you've had a change of heart toward God and yourself, towards sin, toward your own hopelessness. And you'll come to a point where you will humble yourself before God and you will humbly receive the gift of life through Jesus Christ, his son. God is unbelievably good to mankind and continually holds out his hands day after day, calling to people to be saved. This is why we can still enjoy such benefits that he created. You see, if God hated us, he would have destroyed us a long time ago because he has the ability to do that. We are here as a testament of God's patience and love. But even to those who are wicked, who turn their backs on God, who refuse to have anything to do with him, he still shows them love and patience. They still get to benefit from the love of family and friends. Who do you think created that? He did. They still have the blessings of food and water, the joy of a sunset and the cool breeze, the wonder of discovery and of creating things and working together with other people and even doing good. God is good. He is very good. He is too good to us. And so when God calls on his people those who have chosen to follow him who put their faith in jesus he commands them to be like him turn to matthew chapter 5 verse 44 with me because god commands his people those who are born again and saved by jesus christ to have a level of righteousness that is far beyond any other teaching you're going to find in this world because you're not going to find this teaching in any other religion and I challenge you to look for it. Matthew 5.44. Now this is what God calls us to. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, I'm telling you, is that an easy thing to do? To do good to someone who's trying to kill you. To pray for someone who hates you. And look at, look at the next verse, because this connects us with, with God's character. It says, That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God is good. God is good. And that is a core teaching in the Bible that God is good. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so how should I respond to this goodness of God that he's given me all of my life and I haven't appreciated it? Well, it says, take that cup of salvation. He's offering it to you. Take it. Call on him to save you from your sin. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not the reason he sent Jesus into the world, to condemn it but that the world through him might be saved. And as the apostle, that Peter the Apostle preached on the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, when he stood on top of that, of that house and he had thousands of people listening to him on that first day when the Holy Ghost came down, he preached, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is the name of the Lord? Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is both Lord and Saviour. And what is that cup? That cup is him. Jesus says, you must drink of me. You must eat of my flesh. And through that, you will obtain everlasting life. The Bible says that there is no other name under heaven 
given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no one else you can go to who can save you, who has this ability. So how do you respond to God's goodness to you when you didn't deserve it, when I didn't deserve it? You receive his salvation. You call on him to save you. You receive salvation as a gift which was brought sorry, bought at a high price. It cost him the life of his own son. And the ones that he came to save are the ones who killed him and crucified him on a cross. We did that. And so the first response, when you see the goodness of God, is that you will turn and be saved. You will call on him and you will choose to love him in return. And look at the next verses. Psalm 116, 14 and 15, he says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So fulfilling your obligation to the Lord means that you understand that your life has been brought with a price. And God calls us now to obedience. He doesn't call you to obedience before you get saved. He calls you to obedience after you get saved. And then he says a really strange phrase here. He says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why would God, why would it be precious to God when, he's, when those who have put their trust in him die? Because they're with him. Because when someone dies in Christ, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment we pass away, the moment we die, is the moment we stand with our Saviour. We are with him for all of eternity. And that is precious to God. Because we are immediately at home with him. And that's the reason why Christians throughout the ages, when they were being thrown to lions and being torn apart in Colosseums and 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 being lit up as torches in Rome, in the Roman Empire, did it with a song in their heart. What song would you sing as a lion was tearing you apart, I wonder? How would your voice be? You can only sing a song while you're being torn apart by lions if you know exactly where you're going. And you're looking forward to it. Eternity is so much better so much longer than this life that's why what we do in this life matters because there are so many people who are facing eternity away from god in a place of torment in a place where they will be tormented by their own selves even for having thrown away the cup of salvation and so verse 16 says "O lord truly i am thy servant I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. You see, it's only after we get saved that we're free to serve God because he has freed us from the bondage of sin and death. Before then, you can't please God. The Bible says there is no way you can please God. Anything you think that you are doing that's good, that God's going to somehow say, oh, wonderful job, Frank. How wonderful is that? How good are you? The Bible calls those types of works before we get saved filthy rags. So if you can wrap up some filthy rags for Christmas time in a nice box and put them under the Christmas tree and then expect your family when they open it up to be so wrapped that they get it. Imagine if you haven't been saved that you're doing something for God, thinking you're earning merit with him. And when he opens up that box, how he feels. The Bible says that only after you are freed, after, only after you are cleansed, only after you are saved, are you then free to serve God. And so Romans 6.18 says, Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We are free to live. We are free to live the way God designed us to live, which is the greatest freedom and joy anyone can ever have. And verse 17 then says, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of the Lord. The motivation for a Christian is no longer God's going to throw me into hell if I do a sin tomorrow or if I mess up tomorrow. You know, God's going to punish me. That's not our motivation. 
the motivation for other religions may be eternal damnation. But once a Christian has been saved by God, once they have been cleansed of their sin, the Bible says you cannot ever lose that. You have been adopted into his family and you can never be unadopted. You see, as much as your kids may be an absolute headache to you, they're always going to be your kids, aren't they? And that's the same way with God. If we are that patient with our kids, if we are that loving that we don't disown them, how much more is God loving toward us? God never disowns his children. Once he's adopted you in his family, you cannot lose that. You can come before him. You can cause him headaches and he's going to discipline you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a good father, but he will never, ever disown you. And so there is no sacrifice you can give to God. There is no more need for me to, to, be, to be killing goats and lambs and, and bulls and whatever else it is because my sins haven't been forgiven and they have to be covered with that blood. There's no sacrifice needed to be made because the sacrifice has been made. It is complete. There's no more sacrifice needed because he sacrificed his own son who paid for our sin. What sacrifice can I offer God? sacrifice of a thankful life that's the sacrifice god wants to be thankful because in that thanks you will find the greatest joy ever because you have received the greatest gift ever and unless you receive that gift you can never ever appreciate the love of god because you're still rejecting it So the final two verses say, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise you the Lord. You know, the, before he ascended back into heaven, for those of you who don't know where that happened, it was a place in Jerusalem called the Mount of Olives. Okay? And so in the Mount of Olives, he gathered his disciples around him. This is after he rose again. Okay, many days later, because he'd been, he'd spent a lot of time with them after he rose, and then before, as he was before he ascended into heaven, and by, by the way, the Bible says he's coming back, right? He's coming back, and you know where he's going to land? On the Mount of Olives, the same place, all right? So we've got that to look forward to, but he told his disciples before he left. I've got a command for you. I want you to go into all the world and I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want, them, I want you to teach them all that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost and I'm always going to be with you every step of the way. And today, as we're going to watch these people go under that water, that's a continuation of what he commanded 2,000 years ago. The same way, the same message, the same gospel, the same word of God, the same Lord who hasn't abandoned his children and is with us every step of the way. And these ones are committing themselves to him and they're demonstrating to all of us, this is, what I've, this is what's happened to me. And so 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new i'm going to close with a small passage that richard johnson wrote in 1792 um, as he as he sought to as the colony was growing and he sought to minister to the thousands of people that were there he realized he couldn't get around to everyone so he decided to write a small book and and share it around with everyone so they could hear the gospel and i'm going to close with these words because I can't say them any better than what he did, okay? And he said, this is 1792, he said, I have told you again and again that Christ is the way, the truth and the life and there is no coming to God with comfort either in this world or in that which is to come but by him. He has told you so himself. And the apostle assures you that there is no other name under heaven given unto men whereby we can be saved. Look unto him and you shall be saved. If not, you must be damned. This is the plain truth, the express declaration of the Bible, 
life and death are set before you. Permit me as your minister, your friend, and a well-wisher to your souls to press these serious and weighty considerations home upon your consciences one more. I hope and believe that I have asserted nothing but what can be proved by the highest authority, the word of the living God. They certainly deserve your closest and most careful attention, since it is plain beyond a doubt that upon your knowledge or ignorance, your acceptance or rejection of this gospel, your everlasting happiness or misery must depend. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your saviour, then the Bible clearly says that you are damned. Not because you're worse than any of us. On the opposite, we're as bad as each other. But you simply haven't received salvation. We were all drowning in sin and destined for hell. But for those who put up their hand and said, I'll take that salvation, Jesus rescued us. And that's what we have to rejoice in every day. And for those of you who don't know that, who don't understand that, and please don't let this day go by without knowing that for yourself and receiving it. Take the cup of salvation and call upon his name. Let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll have a final hymn by John Newton. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the gospel that has saved our souls. We thank you for your word, which is pure and trustworthy. We thank you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who willingly came down from heaven to this earth, took on the form of a man and willingly went to a cross that he might pay the penalty of our crimes against you. We thank you for your immense love for us. We thank you for your patience, your goodness. And I pray that we would honour you with every day of our lives. You deserve it all. You deserve our lives fully in sacrifice to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We pray for those who have chosen to be baptised today. We thank you for the encouragement they are to the rest of us. And we pray for their witness to their family and friends. Heavenly Father, bless us as we spend this time in fellowship now. I pray if there is any soul here who's, who does not know you, that today would be the day that they open the door of salvation and they allow Jesus in. We thank you once again in his precious name. Amen.